Buongiorno a tutti. Oggi ai Digital Talks di Engage abbiamo il piacere di avere come ospite una grande personalità del panorama pubblicitario mondiale, Sir Martin Sorrell. Restate con noi. Dopo 33 anni alla guida di WPP, contribuendo a farne una delle principali holding pubblicitarie a livello globale, oggi Sir Martin Sorrell è CEO e fondatore di S4 Capital, una società specializzata in digital advertising e marketing services. Lo abbiamo intervistato in esclusiva per farci raccontare i piani di sviluppo di S4 Capital in Italia e la sua personale visione della situazione del mercato pubblicitario post pandemia. Sir Martin, good morning and thanks a lot for taking the time for this interview. Delighted to be with you. I hope that everybody that we all are friends, friends in Italy are safe, safe and well. Yes, yes, yes. Let's hope so. Um, so, all right, everybody's speaking about uh, uh, S4 Capital's global expansion uh, with countless yeah. mergers and uh, an offer um, that is growing wider and wider. Uh, right. so now the Italian market wants to know what are your plans uh, in Italy? Well, you, you know, Italy is uh, one of the most important markets, obviously, uh, in the EU. Britain is now out of the EU, sadly. I, I remain a Remainer, but the, the voters have uh, voted. And what it means is that we have to have a strong presence in all the, the important EU markets. Now, there are 26 of them. Um, we can't be in all 26. We're, we're in some already. We're in, we're in Germany, uh, as you know, with, uh, particularly with, with Staud, which will, will become or has become media monks in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're in France uh, with Dare.Win and we're, we're in on both um, content and data and digital media um, and we're in, uh, we're in Spain as well and we're in Italy with, with Mighty Hive and we're building our business with Media Monks in Italy as well. So the answer to your question in, in all the major EU countries, uh, France, Germany, Italy and Spain, we are building you know, a significant presence in the two practices that we have. The first being content around media monks uh, and the second being data and analytics and digital media around Mighty Hive. And you know that you know, we are moving to a unitary brand. We, we operate as one PML. We don't have any cross-charging between our various companies. They operate already as one P&L, but we'll be moving to a unitary branding in the next few weeks in, in very short order. So uh, that's, those are the plans. I mean, we're in Eastern Europe, in, in Russia, in the Ukraine, in Kazakhstan, mainly, mainly with uh, software programmers and programming. Um, Our business as a whole is about 70% Americas, that's North and South America, about 20% in EMEA, that's Europe uh, and the Middle East and Africa, and about 10% in Asia Pacific. Our long-term objective is to have 40% of our business in the Americas, 20% uh, in, in, in EMEA, and 40% in Asia Pacific. So, Um, Europe will, will be, uh, it is, and always will be a, a major part of our business. And the European business will be dominated by the big five markets, if you like, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, and of course the UK. Um, the UK on its own is probably about five, six, seven percent of our business. So you can see that um, the, the other markets, probably around 13, 14, 15% uh, of, of our business currently. But I'd like us to, to have uh, larger businesses in all those four markets, both Germany, France, Italy, and Spain, and we're in the process of expanding. I mean, our expansion has been driven by uh, the, 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 our clients, And you know, our biggest client is Google. 
Uh, our second biggest client is a major telecoms company. We're not allowed to, we have an NDA on it. We're not allowed to say who it is, but everybody knows who it is. <laughs> um, the, third, the third probably this year will be BMW Mini. Uh, and fourth, Mondelez, or there'll be third and fourth, and the, the fifth is Facebook. About 55% of our revenues come from tech, about 5% from healthcare. So together, tech and healthcare, which are the two sectors that have probably been least affected by COVID, or put a more positive, most stimulated by COVID, they, they, they account for about 60% of our revenue. So we're very tech focused. We're not, we're not a normal agency. We, we, we don't compete really with the holding companies. We compete more with uh, Accenture. I think Accenture is our key competition. They, they, we competed with them on Mondelez. We competed with them on BMW Mini. Uh, we've taken uh, you know, significant assignments from them recently in a number of categories. Uh, and of course, we're hiring people from Accenture. We hired uh, a, a woman to lead our, our data and digital operation in Germany a few days ago from, from Accenture. So I would say our major competition is not from the holding companies. It's from, it's from the, uh, the consultancies, in particular Accenture. I would say the other consultancy is very little. Um, not Deloitte, not PW, not EY, not McKinsey, not Bain, not BCG. McKinsey, Bain and BCG tend to do strategic work, not so much in the, in the marketing area. It, the, the, the competition is Accenture. There are parts of the holding companies like uh, AKQA or VML uh, or Huge or RGA who we compete against, but it, it's chiefly, I would say, Accenture. And we are, you know, we're four billion dollars of market cap. They are 175 billion. So we are like a pimple or a peanut in comparison to uh, Accenture. So that's the that's the competitive environment. So the answer to your question is, you know, Italy will be an increasingly important part of our operation, and we have to expand organically. That's by, you know, adding uh, adding clients and and people, uh, and we will have to expand. Uh, through mergers. We, we, we don't do acquisitions. We don't do earnouts. We're looking for people who want to create the new age, new era advertising and marketing services model uh, and, and want to disrupt the old. So, you know, if you wanted to put it um, dramatically, we, we're, we're the sort of slow of the advertising and marketing services industry or the Amazon of the advertising and marketing services industry, we're trying to disrupt the model because the, the, the holding company model is now 70 years old. I mean, it's not, it's not a model that I started at WPP or we started at Saches uh, or, uh, or indeed at Omnicom or Publicis. It started with IPG and Marion Harper in the 1950s. So we think it's, um, it's not fit for purpose anymore and past its sell-by date. So we're, we're, we're disrupting that old model uh, because we don't think it adequately services our clients' needs. Uh, our people, I mean, one other point, uh, our people are very different to um, agency people. Uh, there's a, a very interesting analysis by uh, BNP Exam, which is one of the analysts. We have 10 analysts who follow us. And one of them, when they initiated the, the coverage, uh, did an analysis of uh, our people on, on LinkedIn and compared it to the people at Publicis and at uh, WPP and came to the conclusion that our people were very different. They tended to come from the tech platforms they came from uh, Google, from Facebook, from Salesforce, that they didn't come from the agency holding companies. Now, as you know, I, th I think in Italy, a large number of people have been terminated, fired, sadly, from the, from the holding companies. Uh, I know that uh, you know, WPP, for example, have lost their country manager. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and have fired a large number of people. 
as they've tried to deal with the COVID. So there are a lot of people inside the holding companies who are unhappy and they, they've been reduced. So, you know, there are a large number of people that are looking for opportunities, but the people that we, we really want to engage with are the people who have strong technology backgrounds. And our business, as you know, is built around first party data driving the creation of content, digital content, and being distributed by digital media. We have, uh, you know, our mission is to create the new model and disrupt the old. The four principles are purely digital. We only do digital, you know, because that's where the growth is. The digital advertising market will grow this year by about 20%. Last year, it was 50% of the market, 50% of the 500 to $550 billion worldwide. This year, we think the share will increase and be up by 20%. Traditional media will probably be up about 3 or 4% on the recovery post the pandemic. But digital will probably have a 70% market share by 2024. So, so you know, it's where the growth is. The second is that holy trinity model that I mentioned of first party data driving the creation of digital content and being distributed through digital media in a continuous loop. So it's rather like running an election campaign without an election date. It's very similar in terms of concept. Thirdly, we're faster, better, cheaper, or speed, quality, value. So faster means agility. Better means understanding about 20 companies and their role digitally with our clients. So Google, Facebook, Amazon, Tencent, Alibaba, TikTok, Apple, Microsoft, Adobe, Oracle, Salesforce, IBM, SAP, Twitter, Snap, Pinterest, uh, LG, Samsung, Spotify, Netflix, Xiaomi, JD.com. Those are the companies that we, we have to understand and help our clients pick hardware, software, and uh, platform partners, uh, that those that are most su suitable. So if something comes along like Clubhouse, or indeed TikTok has come along and become a major force. The dominant forces are Google, Amazon, uh, and, and Facebook. You know, they are, Google last year was probably about $180 billion of advertising revenues, Facebook about 80 billion, Amazon about 20, and the market is probably about, the digital market's probably about 275 billion last year. So they dominate. But, you know, there are others like TikTok, like Snap, like Twitter, like Pinterest, like I'm sure Clubhouse will as well, that are becoming more and more important as platforms. So we have to understand so how they're developing. So that's better. And then cheaper is about efficiency. In a world that, that generally grows at 2 3 or 4%, where there's very little inflation, Clients have very little pricing power, so they're very focused on cost. So that's cheaper. That's the third point. And then the fourth point is we have a unitary structure. We have this one PL, seamless. We operate as one, not as fragmented silos uh, within, uh, as you see within the holding companies. So those are the four things, you know, purely digital, the holy trinity of data and content and digital media faster, better, cheaper, and a unitary structure. So that's what we're about. And we'll, we'll, we'll build that steadily uh, in Italy too. Uh, you mentioned uh, mergers as uh, one of the main drivers of uh, S4 Capital's uh, uh, expansion. Is there any particular company or sector that uh, you think could be strategic uh, to the company's growth? Uh, well, uh, are you talking about generally worldwide? Uh, worldwide and in Italy too. Well, I mean, we continue to do. You see what we, we've done in January. We we added to our businesses uh, in uh, in the United States with decoded on the on the content side uh, and on the media side and metric theory on the performance media side. Uh, we added tomorrow uh, in Shanghai, uh, so that doubled doubled our presence in, in China. So we, we, we effectively emerged the leading independent agency, campaigns agency of the year, 
with Campaign's Production Agency of the Year, our, our Media Monks, to form Media Monks uh, China. Um, we added uh, Stout Germany, you know, on the back of the, the BMW Mini Win. We pitched the business with Stout and you know, they've become part of Media Monks. And then finally, we added Datalicious uh, in Australia, which is a, a, another data asset that we, we've added to, to Mighty Hive in, in Australia. So you should expect us to do the same, to continue to do the same. So uh, our organic growth rate, you know, we've said we want to double the size of the company in three years between 2021 and 2023, like we've done 2019 to 21 and 2020 to 22. So we, we have a three-year plan we update every year. And we've done three three-year plans. And each of the plans has called for a doubling of the company uh, over three years, which mathematically means a growth rate of about 24%. So we've budgeted this year 25%. Last year, uh, the market is expecting us to have done somewhere between 15 to 20 percent and we report our numbers on march the 18th and you'll see uh you know where where we've ended up we're obviously at the north end of that range which in a covid year when the holding companies are down by five ten percent we will be up i you know i can't say exactly where but you you can assume we'll be up 15 to 20 percent so so that's organic growth. And then growth by acquisition or merger has been, has been around the same, maybe a bit more. So the top line growth last year, including mergers, probably be about 60, 70, 80%. So um, I would say that on balance, we will probably grow by about 25% organically and by about 25% through mergers. The, the five things that we've done in January and the beginning of February uh, expand the base of the business by about 20, 25%. So I, I would say what we're targeting is, uh, is growing the company by 25% organically and 25% through mergers. So we would expect to at least grow by about 50% a year. Let's talk about uh, uh, Mighty Hive, uh, your data and digital media uh, practice. Uh, Mighty Hive was actually uh, the first of your companies to open uh, a local office uh, in Italy. Uh, it was a few years ago here in Milan. Uh, how is uh, the company performing in the country? Who is leading the team and uh, uh, what strategic goals have you set for the local office uh, in 2021 the operations in europe are, are run by sasha schmitz out of out of london and she's responsible for emia that's not just uh, europe but the middle east and africa mm -hmm. and she's built building a team there uh, in milan and but you know your our, our business is not you know in, in this day and age our business it's one p l so just think about you know, you tend to think, you know, Engage is in Italy, you're looking at the Italian market. Uh, we tend to look at the, at the market globally, or at least the Americas, EMEA and Asia Pacific. So we tend to look at things as one. And each of our hubs, um, you know, one of the things about the new economy, you know, we're in 31 countries. When I was at WPP, we were in 113 countries. WPP doesn't need to be in 113 countries anymore. So the, the, the world has changed. And, you know, for example, in Buenos Aires, we have about, what is it now, 350, 400 people. In California, we have about 1,000 people. In Amsterdam, we have about 1,000 people. We have concentrations of people who are servicing business regionally or indeed globally. So looking at individual countries now is, uh, in our view, not the right way of going about it. You're, you're trying to integrate. I mean, when, when we won the BMW mini business, it's not about 
Germany, it's about 27 countries in, in the EU, 20 different sales organizations. So you have to think about it on, in a much more holistic way. And the model, the model of the holding companies have, have built, we don't think is fit for purpose anymore. It has to be a much more integrated model. It's not going to be driven by individual countries as much as it was. There will be individual countries that are important. And I've said to you, in a European context, it'll be Germany, France, Italy, Spain, and of course the UK. So those are the five sort of key points. But as I said also, we have, we have software uh, development areas you know, or, or, or people in Russia, in the Ukraine, and in Kazakhstan. So that's the basic pattern. So I think, you know, your question implies that we look at it in a traditional way. We don't. If your question is, you know, are there companies in Italy that could effectively, there are certainly people in Italy that we will hire or that we, we think would like to join us. Uh, so there will be organic growth in that sense, both on the content side and the the data and digital media side and there will be companies and we we've, we've talked to several companies in italy one of the problems in italy is a lack of transparency mm. and and our our model is a is a transparent one and and i think that's one of the things that is changing not just in italy but but elsewhere so transparency is, is really important. You know, it became an important issue in the advertising industry from about 2016, when the ANA started to inquire into uh, discount structures, rebate structures and the like. So I, I think, uh, particularly on the digital side of things, you know, we're looking really to implement a, a transparent model and that's how Mighty Hive has always run its, run its business. And that, that's not necessarily the way that the business has been run historic, historically, uh, not just in Italy, but elsewhere. All right. I'd like to end this conversation with a, a more generic question about uh, yeah. uh, the current situation of the digital marketing uh, industry. So right. um, how do you think uh, the... Um, the, the market, the digital marketing industry will change in the post pandemic and what role will agencies have in this new evolved situation? Yeah, so again, you know, we're not, we're not a conventional agency. So, so you have to put that to one side. So uh, I mean, what COVID has done, it hasn't changed things. It's accelerated things. So it's accelerated uh, digital change or digital transformation at three levels. Firstly, consumer level. So we're meeting online. Uh, consumers, I don't know whether you have family or not, but you know, my, my children or my grandchildren are being educated online. We're developing our financial services online. We're buying groceries and essentials online. For example, in America, in the very early days of the pandemic, 30% uh, of U.S. households bought things online for the very first time. So people are experienced. So at a consumer level, it's accelerated adoption in home games and entertainment, the streamers, etc. That's one level. The second level, it's accelerated change with media companies. So you know that traditional newspapers and magazines have been closed faster, you know, Rupert Murdoch closed, I think 140 titles in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so it accelerated change with news, traditional newspapers and magazines. It accelerated the growth of the streamers, Netflix and Disney Plus, and Disney Plus probably the most successful new product launch of, of all time. Uh, and it accelerated the growth of digital 
uh, out of home as opposed to traditional billboard advertising. So that's media. And then finally, it is accelerated digital transformation in enterprises inside companies. So companies that were hesitant before historically to change because they didn't want to disrupt the status quo. COVID disrupted the status quo, changed things very significantly. And as a result, uh, change agents inside companies are being given from what we can see much more oxygen. So when I think about the major shifts that we're seeing at clients, it's because clients want to change faster. They want to, to make up, you know, to, to accelerate the pace of change with the enterprise. And COVID-19 gave them, you know, in Q2 of last year, things, things were so difficult that all the arguments to maintain the status quo disappeared. And people said, let's get on with the change. So one of the things that we hear all the time is our clients wanting to implement their 2024 plan in 2021. So they want to accelerate the change. So I think the answer to your question is that as a result of COVID, we're seeing acceleration in change at a consumer level within the media, which you would see. And then finally, at the company level, at the enterprise level. And what do I think the changes are going to look like? Well, if you think about how we are going to work, there'll be fewer people in offices 100% of the time. I, we will probably move to a model where we're in the office maybe three times a week as opposed to five days a week. Uh, a model where there's more dispersed living, where people will live more remotely, apart from working more remotely, and more flexible working times. Probably I will travel less. Uh, I probably will go for longer trips, but fewer of them. So I think my travel pattern will change. And you know, I was talking to one of, um, one of our clients, uh, which has operations in Italy, um, in, the, in the luxury business. And he was saying, you know, there's no need for me to go to Beijing uh, as many times as I used to, because I can do a lot of this on Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever it happens to be. Uh, but, you know, I, I will be much more selective in the way that, that, that I travel. So I think there will be different patterns of travel. So those are some of the changes that I think will take place. Now, it, it's enabled us to accelerate our change much more rapidly. Because for example, in London or New York or San Francisco or Buenos Aires or Amsterdam, you know, we've been able to drop leases and consolidate our offices much, much more quickly and with a different footprint because the needs what people want from offices in terms of meeting space or meeting with clients, as opposed to sitting there working, that's going to change. So I think those are some of the things. Now, from a category point of view, there are going to be some categories like tech, like healthcare, like in-home games and entertainment that are much more V-shaped in terms of recovery. There will be packaged goods companies that will be much more U-shaped because there are multi-categories, which different, you know, for example, you look at Unilever, its personal care business has done well, but its food business has suffered because of lack of distribution. Procter & Gamble, on the other hand, is really a daily use health and hygiene company. And so it's very well positioned for the implications of COVID, of health and hygiene. So packaged goods companies, their recovery will be more U-shaped and it'll be a flatter U if they're multi-category. And then the L-shaped, the ones that will have find it difficult to recover, are obviously the travel and hospitality companies. So you'll see, you'll see different rates of recovery in different sectors. Our business, as I said to you, is focused in tech 
and healthcare. And those are the categories that are probably the strongest from a V-shaped point of view. My own view is that 2021 will be a very strong year. Uh, after Q2, when the vaccines kick in, we'll see a very strong recovery in the world economy. I think worldwide GDP will be up this year by about 5 to 6%. And we haven't seen growth of that, of that scale since the 1980s. And I think 2022, it will be about 4 to 5%. Again, so we will have two very strong years. I think then the question mark is when, how will economies and governments pay for the, the cost of COVID and the cost of change? You know, for example, in the case of the UK, Brexit as well. And so I think after 2022, things will get more difficult. But 21, we will see a very sharp recovery, I think, economically. And that obviously will be very good for digital advertising because digital advertising is correlated to GDP growth. Traditional advertising will continue to be under pressure in my view. It will recover a bit this year, but the growth is gonna come from digital. You see that in Italy, you see that in every market in Europe. So the traditional media will continue to be under pressure. Newspapers and magazines in their traditional form free-to-air television uh, is going to be under pressure. So I think that's generally what we see happening. Okay, all right. I would like to thank you a lot for, for this Pleasure. conversation. And uh, I Pleasure. hope you will be our guest for new follows-up and reflections about yeah, the, the industry. Absolutely. Anytime, anytime you want to talk, Alessandra, let me know. Great. Okay. Thank you a lot. Very good. Have a lovely day. Stay well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.